Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSENG, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, the politics that's making strange bedfellows. Where else can you find a coalition of unions supporting a former Goldman Sachs executive and blasting a fellow union member? It must be budget time in Trent. A lot more riders, not enough buses. NJ Transit blames a jam-packed Port Authority bus terminal. Riders just want the capacity crisis solved. I'll tell you about Atlantic City's newest world-class data center that is supporting everything from esports to big companies. Plus, the next in our climate change series, New Jersey's facing the future, the costly, consequential plan to cut carbon emissions. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. <laughs> from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello and thank you for joining us on air and online. We start with a step down Senate President Steve Sweeney's path to progress. A Senate committee has approved a package of bills aimed at getting county and municipal governments, school districts and public safety to share or even consolidate services to save money. But some protesters are calling it a path to poverty. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports. Only in Trenton during budget season will you find a coalition of progressives and labor unions cheering a former Goldman Sachs executive and denouncing a fellow union member. But such was the case today as public employees showed up by the hundreds to call for the passage of a millionaire's tax, supported by the millionaire governor, and adamantly opposed by the iron worker Senate president. I don't care what your job is, where you come from, you either stand for the people of New Jersey or you're standing strictly for 18,000 millionaires in this state. It's a bit ironic that that particular tax was passed five different times in this state legislature and we finally got a governor who said absolutely we will have fairness and suddenly nobody wants to put the millionaires tax. That's the irony. With less than a week to go before the legislature presents its budget, leaders say with no millionaires tax, the governor's coalition is making it personal, calling out Sweeney as a hypocrite for not allowing an up or down vote on the tax and asking for concessions from public unions. Workers lose. All I know is that the workers always lose. The workers are always on the receiving end. We get used as leverage. I mean, the governor is right on his budget. I b agree with him and I believe him and I think that the legislature needs to pass a responsible budget that includes sustainable revenue. The Senate president was scheduled to address the conference of the AARP here at the Masonic Temple, which is about a block or so from where the demonstrations are taking place. Ironically enough, most of these buses are carrying demonstrators to the protests, which may or may not explain why the Senate president is not here. Sweeney did tell us he couldn't talk because he was in meetings most of the day, at least part of them reportedly with the governor and Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin, who we managed to run into outside the Masonic Temple. This hasn't really been billed as Coughlin's fight, but the speaker could ultimately play a big role in bringing the two sides together. One side says we need a millionaire's tax, the other side said no new taxes. Where are you guys going to meet? Hopefully somewhere where we, we can all uh, uh, do what we, we really want to do, which is to get a budget done that is good for the state of New Jersey uh, and is, is you know, it, it serves all of our interests. You're going to be the peacemaker then? Oh, I get credit for that. That's maybe, I don't know if I always deserve it, but we'll, we'll, look, I'll certainly do whatever I can to try and, and, and get a budget across the goal line, but that, that's not unique to me. The governor and the Senate president work in good faith too to try and get something done, so. Still talking. Still talking. With the state government shutdown looming in less than three weeks, sources say talks are ongoing, and issues like reforms to the state's tax incentive programs could yet play a part in a final deal. But on the record, both sides remain steadfast, and no one is making any plans 
for the first few days in July. In Trenton, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. The fate of the state's controversial EDA tax incentive program that doled out billions in tax breaks to businesses is up for grabs. Brianna Vernozzi is at the State House. We have here 17,000 pages of emails from 2013 to 2016. The meeting of the Assembly Commerce and Economic Development Committee started with the kind of theatrics only a Trenton hearing can. Activists disrupting testimony, dropping off boxes of alleged emails between the state's Economic Development Authority and the law firm Parker McKay. That's the agency accused of helping to write parts of the tax incentive program known as Grow New Jersey to benefit companies tied to South Jersey power boss George Norcross. Until every single one of these emails has been reviewed by this committee, this law should not be extended. But with the June 30th deadline around the corner, lawmakers have little choice, taking testimony on a bill to allow the program to extend for seven months, giving the legislature more time to come up with a plan. And we would urge, urge the governor and the legislature to work collaboratively together to provide a temporary transition until a more permanent solution could be finished. Let me say this, a state that lets its economic growth incentives lapse signals that it's out of business. But Governor Murphy is poised to let the program lapse when it expires, pointing to a state comptroller report and the findings of his task force that show some companies falsify documents to game the system and increase their incentive awards. These programs have been inefficient. They have been unaffordable for the state. They have been ineffective and they have not, they have not always been the best investment. Members of the committee heard from business lobbyists and think tanks on potential reforms, like the governor's idea for a hard cap on the amount of incentives that can be awarded in a year. Why do you favor an overall cap on yearly expenditures rather than creating a system where we cap uh, pro the, the support for specific projects? No mayor or freeholder or anyone in charge of a government would have a line item in a budget that they did not know what that was going to cost them, right? right? And so we feel like it's very dangerous for the state to not at least have a cap, which really in our eyes is a budget. Christina Renna of the South Jersey Chamber of Commerce told lawmakers her organization learned earlier this week two businesses with commitments to move into Camden City are pulling out. One cited the political climate as the sole reason. Because it's an unfriendly place to do business, we need an uncapped incentive program to be able to have any tool in our tool chest to attract businesses to New Jersey. With hesitation, both this and the Assembly Appropriations Committee passed the bill sending it to the Senate. And I'm comfortable with extending it because I think that the choices that we now have put ourselves at backs against the wall give us no choice. But it was our own doing that put our backs against this wall. Though its fate is all but certain, according to a spokesperson for the governor. The governor has always been inclined to work with the legislature on a new incentives package. This did not have to come down to an 11th hour vote to extend flawed legislation. During his first budget speech in March 2018, the governor asked the legislature not to wait until the last minute. If an extension of the current program is passed without the necessary reforms, the governor will have no choice but to veto it. Senate President Sweeney says he is prepared to lead a veto override if it comes to that, but there's another scenario here where the bill makes its way to Governor Murphy's desk and he simply does nothing, allowing the program to expire. And that's a power move that could lead to interesting negotiations. At the State House, Brianna Venozzi, NJTV News. The state of New Jersey's health tops tonight's business news. Rhonda Schaffler is away today. Here's Joanna Gagas. Joanna? Mary Alice, New Jersey's healthcare system is improving. A new report by the Commonwealth Fund ranked it 20th in the nation, up from 25th place last year. Contributing to the good score, the state's support of healthy living, few adult smokers, and low rates of death from suicide and alcohol use. But overdose death continues to rise even as opioid prescriptions have dropped. There were more than 3,000 drug-related deaths last year, double the amount in 2016. To dive deeper into this story, head to njspotlight.com, where Lilo Staten analyzes the 50 indicators used to rank all the state's health care systems. Gaming revenues in the state continue to soar. The Division of Gaming Enforcement released numbers for May, showing a $59 million increase over last May. 
Internet gaming wins also saw a nearly 58% spike, totaling $38.3 million in May. And total revenue gaming from January to May is $1.31 billion. That's a $28 million increase over the same period last year. The Keegan landfill in the Meadowlands will remain temporarily closed. The state Supreme Court overturned a superior court ruling that had allowed it to stay open despite complaints from Kearney officials and residents saying that noxious fumes were permeating the air. Site inspections in May and June showed hydrogen sulfide le levels at more than 30 parts per billion. That's higher than the legal limit. Exposure to the gas can cause headaches, dizziness, fatigue, and breathing problems. The case will head back to court in July. The Anthony Bourdain New Jersey Food Trail launched today in honor of the late chef, TV host, and Jersey native. It features 10 Garden State restaurants that were featured on Bourdain's show, Parts Unknown. The markets closed up. The Dow increased by 101 points. And those are your top business stories. Amtrak's um, upcoming track work at New York Penn Station may not be Summer of Hell, the sequel, but starting Monday, it will divert some North Jersey coastline and all Montclair Booten Line trains to Hoboken for the next three months. Those who consider trying their luck on a bus may want to hear what State Senator Loretta Weinberg heard. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was with her. During rush hour, New Jersey transit buses in Bergen County queue up to onboard passengers who often find buses already full. And riders claim the crowded buses can run late, even when they're rolling 110 buses an hour during the morning peak. That's a bus every 70 seconds on Teaneck Road. It's still standing room only. Eight times out of 10, I'm standing going in and everybody else who gets on after me. At a public hearing for bus riders, commuters complained some people drive to other towns with earlier bus stops just to get a seat. For years it's been standing room only in Palisades Park. So now people drive from Palisades Park to Leonia. Everything that we have with wheels is rolling. We don't have buses sitting in the garage that we just don't want to get in. Um, the fact of the matter is that everything we have is out there carrying passengers, and they're full. Officials from NJ Transit and the Port Authority, invited to the meeting by Senator Loretta Weinberg of Teaneck, told riders they're squeezing as much bus capacity as they can out of a seriously overburdened system. In Bergen County, 600 more passengers ride NJ Transit buses than last year, and the agency's got a 93% on-time arrival record at the Port Authority bus terminal, according to officials. There are 600 more people trying to board those buses in the same time frame. So you'll start to see some of those lines begin to grow. NJ Transit's also addressing a severe driver shortage. It's hired more than 400 new drivers over the past 18 months, training them to get required commercial driver's licenses and paying them 20 bucks an hour to beat the competition. It also needs to replace creaky 18-year-old vehicles with two million miles on them. Buses that break down, leak when it rains, and plague passengers with discomforts. It's really terrible. I'm gonna be my own cushion one day. You're gonna bring your own cushion? <laughs> yeah. The seats are that bad? Yeah. But even if they had a whole new fleet with drivers trained and ready, the Port Authority bus terminal couldn't handle more buses during the peak rush hours. A $3.7 billion plan to expand the terminal is moving forward, but it's years from completion. And with American Dream in the Meadowlands, opening within months, even more riders will be onboarding. Whether New Jersey Transit had the seats or not, the Port Authority bus terminal needs to be rebuilt in order to, to allow that growth. You see how all of this is interlocking and we are at capacity in our infrastructure. There is just no more room. Bus riders appreciated the upgrades and plans for expansion, but right now the system just can't handle the booming demand for public transportation, and the paying public is predictably unhappy. In Teaneck, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Beneath Atlantic City's convention center, new servers processing big data will allow the casino capital to connect to the world and compete with Las Vegas, and that's not all. Here's Raven Santana. 
if you have congestion on the Garden State Parkway, is there an alternative route that you can take? Uh, and uh, that's what this is. Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Continent 8, Michael Tobin, isn't talking about vehicular traffic. He means internet traffic and is referring to Atlantic City's new secret weapon, this state-of-the-art data center that will be a hub for global connectivity spanning over 30 locations worldwide. The information technology provider licensed by the State Division of Gaming Enforcement took a year to design and build the 6,000-foot facility located in the city's convention center. Due to security reasons, the media wasn't allowed inside, but we were told the data center holds everything from storage systems to 24-7 on-site personnel, allowing a secure and reliable network for gamers to compete and spectators to bet on major events like eSports. Data is king. Uh, it's not just uh, the person walking up to the kiosk, it's people, it's going to be online, it's going to be all these issues of knowing your client, tech, tech, tech. Everything is connected uh, to a server someplace in, in the world, and where those places are, are data centers. You need alternative pathways if there's blockages, if there's uh, private uses that you need for them. Gaming being one of them because it's regulated, uh, having a regulated uh, network becoming a bigger and bigger requirement for people. Tobin, along with his team, joined local legislators and gaming executives to discuss how the new technical infrastructure could attract tech companies and jobs to the region. The next uh, inventor of, uh, uh, of, a, of a video game might come from a student that goes to Stockton or Atlantic Cape Community College. Economic development initiatives can be promoted by having something like this. Say, so, you know what, we can connect you, literally, technology company, IT company, and your staffing to, to the world. And the data center isn't just for esports and gaming, it's also being used as a secure network for big companies and universities. Whether it's a hospital, an educational uh, business, and protecting the individuals who uh, are using the uh, data to, for either social or entertainment or business purposes, is so critical in the world today. Continent 8 spent $8 million building the center. Tobin says he's confident that the investment hasn't just established Atlantic City as a hub for online sports betting and gaming, but as a reason for more companies to relocate. In Atlantic City, Raven Santana and JTV News. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Even as the federal government rolls back programs to curb the carbon emissions that contribute to climate change, the state is moving to cut greenhouse gases by 80%. To coincide with an encore presentation of the national PBS series, Sinking Cities, we present part two of the series we've been working on since last winter on how the state of New Jersey, its top scientists, engineers, urban planners, and its citizens are addressing the peril and promise of climate change. With the state already starting to weather the effects of climate change, more intense storms, higher temperatures, and rising seas, Governor Phil Murphy's landmark clean energy bill puts the state on a path to achieving the highest standard for renewable energy in the country, requiring 50% of the state's power to come from clean renewables like wind and solar by the year 2050. The Clean Energy Act makes a, a good start on uh, bringing us something new, community solar. New community solar that Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner Catherine McCabe says would be available to all, including people living in low-income housing developments and multifamily complexes. Or even if they cannot put solar panels on their roof, they'll be able to participate in community-based solar projects that will allow them to uh, participate in getting their home energy from solar energy. New New Jersey is already one of the nation's leading solar energy states with nearly 100,000 arrays installed. It's the fastest growing segment of the state's clean energy sector. But the system's costs passed on to customers are high. 
The Murphy administration recently published a draft of the state's new energy master plan on how it wants to produce, distribute, consume, and conserve energy. The plan lays out an ambitious roadmap to achieve the governor's clean energy goals, from pushing renewables to expanding the power grid and heating homes and businesses with electricity. But it also maintains the state's heavy reliance on natural gas which heats 75 percent of New Jersey homes. Now, the prospect of installing pipelines across the state has been controversial, but McCabe says is actually cheaper and greener, too. The natural gas structure that was built has helped to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the state of New Jersey over the past eight or ten years. The state's nuclear plants emit no greenhouse gases at all, so the commissioner says they'll remain a key part of the energy portfolio. Salem and Hope Creek are both at the now uh, at the end of um, the Delaware River, where it comes out in, into the uh, bay there, and they are on the water, but they are built extremely well and have taken a lot of precautions to prevent uh, being damaged. The new energy blueprint encourages utilities to further upgrade the power grid onshore, and they may have to consider connecting to power from offshore. Governor Murphy's executive order includes an ambitious plan to harness the wind. His goal is to generate 3,500 megawatts of offshore wind energy, enough to power a million and a half homes by 2030. Some developers are already lining up to bid. The Danish company Orsted has opened an office in Atlantic City to support the firm's ocean wind project, a 250-square-mile patch of sea some 10 miles off Atlantic City's coast that would be the future site of wind turbines. Norwegian company Equinor is eyeing wind farms off Sandy Hook that it says could be up and running by 2024. Another developer is looking at tracks off Cape May. The huge scale of the wind farms might first require the state to train a workforce, develop a supply chain, invest hundreds of millions of dollars upgrading the ports to handle the assembly and shipping of the giant turbines. The state may also be required to make an upfront investment in electrical vehicle charging stations that can support electric vehicles. At least as of today, the federal incentive is in place for the purchase of electric vehicles. And we need to get a charging infrastructure underway. Uh, DEP has a program called It Pays to Plug In. We've spent about $800,000 so far and have a $2.5 million waiting list. Uh, for It has been for a workplace charger so far, but we're expanding the program so that multi-unit dwellings will also be able to have electric chargers. Dr. Robert Kopp, director of the Rutgers Institute of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences, has an eye on the policy policies of clean energy as well as the science. Is Governor Murphy on the right track? I think he, he, he has, is heading in the right direction. Um, the, the state has launched a coastal resilience planning process. And it can't be a top-down process. It really has to be a process that hears voices of the people in our municipality and, and leads to strategies that are owned by coastal communities. The BPU is holding hearings around the state to get feedback and they hope buy-in from citizens. So th what the BPU and, and we and the government entirely needs to be doing is looking for the sweet spot that is what we need to do, but what we can afford. Still, the rollout of clean energy will be costly, and the greatest challenge will be finding a way to pay for replacing an aging power grid and funding the state's ambitious energy goals while keeping your utility bills affordable. At 9 o'clock tonight, an encore presentation of the PBS series Sinking Cities looks at how Tokyo is adapting to the reality of climate change. Tomorrow on NJ Spotlight, Tom Johnson will be reporting on a newly released NJ Conservation Foundation study that projects the environmental costs of two natural gas pipelines in the Delaware River Basin. Tom, what are the projected damages? They talk about greenhouse, increased greenhouse gas emissions. They talk about decline in water quality, fragmentation of uh, habitat, and um, ecosystems disruption. And it's important because the basin provides drinking water to 15 million people in four states. Okay, thank you, Tom. And you can sign up for Spotlight's daily newsletter. Go to njspotlight.com and click on NJ Spotlight Newsletters.
us some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. The NJEA, New Jersey's largest teachers union, has 203,520 members. Gross revenue from sports wagering in New Jersey totaled $15.5 million in May. New Jersey Transit operates more than 250 bus routes. And New Jersey's warmed by about three degrees Fahrenheit over the last century. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, a program that's connecting homeless people to paying jobs. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. W.J. Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Lead funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagalos and Diana T. Vagalos. Major support is provided by the Mark Haas Foundation and Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III.